July 30, 1945, 12.27 a.m., the moment the USS Indianapolis sinks. 900 men struggled to stay afloat in the black waters of the Pacific Ocean after their ship was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. They watch in horror as the last chunks of the Indianapolis sink below the surface. Many are covered in oil. Others suffer from serious wounds. Blood seeps into the water as the sailors bob up and down, trying to figure out what to do next. In the coming days, hundreds will die from dehydration, starvation, and hysteria, but they're the lucky ones, because just below the stranded sailors are hungry sharks that will tear them limb from limb and drag anyone separated from their group into the deep, dark abyss. November 7, 1931, 14 years before the USS Indianapolis sinks. A heavy cruiser rolls into the waters of the Delaware River and sails toward the Atlantic Ocean. Military personnel and civilians all along the shore watch the newest addition to the U.S. naval fleet proceed to open waters. The vessel is a technological marvel. It's 610 feet or 186 meters long and displaces approximately 9,950 tons of water. On board are nine 8-inch guns and eight 5-inch anti-aircraft cannons. Eight boilers deep in the bowels of the ship turn four humongous steam turbines that propel the ship to 32 knots. The ship enters the open waters of the Atlantic, and the crew reports from all stations. Everything's in working order, and the sailors on board will continue to put this vessel through the ringer for the next year before it's formally commissioned on November 15, 1932, as the USS Indianapolis. January 1, 1933, 12 years before the USS Indianapolis sinks. President Franklin D. Roosevelt visits the Indianapolis. He inspects the deck of the ship, examining the cannons and talking to the crew. The president decides this vessel will be perfect for his ship of state. Whenever he travels to visit other dignitaries in Europe or around the world, the Indianapolis will be his go-to mode of transportation. Three years later, President Roosevelt will sail aboard this ship to conduct his good neighbor tour around South America. February 20, 1942, three years before the USS Indianapolis sinks. The Japanese bombers roar overhead. The Indianapolis fires its anti-aircraft cannons into the sky, decimating a bomber before it can drop its payload. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor just a few months ago, an event that would live in infamy and thrust the U.S. into the Second World War. Now the Indianapolis is off the coast of Bougainville, Papua New Guinea, as a part of the United States Navy Aircraft Carrier Task Force. Their mission is to attack the Japanese military base at Rabaul, New Britain. Planes are launched from the deck of the carrier to pursue the Japanese aircraft as they retreat from their bombing run. The Indianapolis maneuvers into position to provide further support if needed. 15 out of the 17 Japanese bombers are destroyed by the fleet. It's in this engagement that the USS Indianapolis receives its first battle star. February 19, 1943, two years and five months before the USS Indianapolis sinks. Vice Admiral Raymond Spruant stands on the bridge of the Indianapolis. He's recently been given command of the U.S. Fifth Fleet and made the USS Indianapolis its flagship. The naval force is heading out on patrol along the Atu Island chain in the waters off the coast of what will become the state of Alaska. Their mission is to stop any Japanese ships from reinforcing their forces at Kiska and Atu. One of the sailors on the bridge informs Vice Admiral Spruance that a vessel has just appeared on the horizon. The fleet changes course to intercept. It's a Japanese cargo ship. The Indianapolis chases it down and fires. The transport explodes, illuminating the sky. The vessel rejoins the Fifth Fleet, which continues to patrol the area. In the coming years, the USS Indianapolis will earn nine battle stars for various operations in the Pacific. The ship has shown to be a powerful weapon and continues to be favored as the flagship of the fleet. February 14, 1945, five months before the USS Indianapolis sinks. It's Valentine's Day, but there's no love to be had during war. The battle for Europe has swung in the favor of the Allies. After Hitler and his Nazi forces tried to invade the Soviet Union, things began to fall apart. Now it seems that war in Europe could be over in a matter of months. However, the fight for the Pacific still rages, and the USS Indianapolis is playing a leading role in that fight. The heavy cruiser has met up with Vice Admiral Mark A. Mitcher's Fast Carrier Task Force. They're on their way to Tokyo to bombard the city in a distraction for the landings at Iwo Jima. The targets on the main island are Japanese air facilities and naval yards, but the task force has free reign to target any asset they can spot that might deal a blow to the Japanese war machine. The waters are choppy, clouds are low as a storm passes over the coast of Japan. This hides the incoming task force from Japanese early warning measures. When the first cannons from the U.S. naval ships fire, it catches the enemy by surprise. The Indianapolis unleashes hell using its 8-inch guns. Attack planes buzz overhead. U.S. fighters launch from the carriers to meet them. The Indianapolis fires into the sky using its anti-air guns. At the end of the bombardment, 
the US loses 49 planes while the Japanese lose 499. The task force also manages to sink a carrier, nine coastal ships, a destroyer, two escorts, and a cargo ship. This is all on top of the damage done to land-based targets such as hangars, factories, and weapon caches. The mission is a success. The task force sails at full speed to the Bonin Islands, where the Indianapolis and other vessels will aid in the landing on Iwo Jima, which began on February 19th. When the Indianapolis arrives, it begins bombarding key targets to allow ground forces to land on various islands. It's a bloodbath, but the Indianapolis and its crew do their part to help U.S. troops gain a foothold in the region. March 18, 1945, four months before the USS Indianapolis sinks. The fast carrier force has issued new orders to proceed to Okinawa. The Indianapolis and other ships will bombard airfields across the island to keep the Japanese from launching raids from the location. This will reduce the amount of resistance U.S. forces will face when the impending invasion of the main island commences. If the aircraft on Okinawa are not dealt with, it could have disastrous consequences for the invasion fleet. The task force reaches the island of Kyushu and positions itself approximately 100 miles or 160 kilometers away from its shores. The Indianapolis and other vessels fire on the island and decimate the airfield on Kyushu along with several ships and the harbors of Kobe and Kure on southern Honshu. The attack has been a success and will play a pivotal role in the engagements to come. Three days later, the Japanese locate the fast attack force and send 48 planes to attack it. A siren goes off aboard the aircraft carrier as pilots run to their planes. They launch from the deck and fly over the Indianapolis. The Japanese aircraft are closing fast. The American planes engage them in dogfights above the ocean. Every last one of the Japanese fighters are shot down before they can reach the task force. On March 24th, the USS Indianapolis is assigned to join Task Force 54 in preparation for the invasion of Okinawa. The fleet of ships begins shelling the island. For seven days straight, the Indianapolis fires round after round. Its ammunition stores are vast, but the non-stop bombardment means the weapon stores are beginning to run low. However, with every shot fired, the Indianapolis destroys Japanese beach defenses. This will end up saving the lives of countless American soldiers in the days to come. The Indianapolis also shoots down six planes over the duration of the mission. Just before the invasion of the island on March 31st, lookouts aboard the USS Indianapolis spot an incoming enemy aircraft. It's a Japanese Nakajima Kai-43 fighter. The planes race toward the heavy cruiser. Sailors run to their battle stations. They fire up at the sky, but the Japanese pilot manages to avoid the onslaught of anti-aircraft fire. The enemy plane releases its bomb from 25 feet, or around 7.6 meters above the main deck, and then crashes just off the port stern. It's likely this was a kamikaze run gone wrong, but the bomb still hit its target. The explosive device falls through the top deck and into the mess hall. It then goes straight through the berthing compartment and the fuel tanks before exiting the Indianapolis and detonating in the water underneath the ship. This causes a massive amount of damage, but things could have been so much worse if the bomb had gone off within the vessel itself. Nine sailors are killed as the explosion rips holes in the keel, flooding the compartments within. The heavy cruiser begins to list to port. The Indianapolis is brought to a salvage ship for emergency repairs, but the engineers only have bad news to report. The propellers are damaged and the fuel tank has been ruptured. Repairs are made to vital systems so the Indianapolis can travel under its own volition, but it needs to head to port before it'll be ready for battle again. The ship docks at Mare Island Naval Shipyard, 25 miles northeast of San Francisco, for extensive repairs. July 12, 1945, 18 days before the USS Indianapolis sinks. The repairs on the ship are complete. Captain Charles B. McVeigh III receives an urgent communique that he should ready the USS Indianapolis for a secret mission. Three days later, the heavy cruiser sails to Hunter's Point Navy Yard in San Francisco, where the crew awaits further orders. July 16, 1945, 14 days before the USS Indianapolis sinks. The sun is just beginning to rise over the Horanda del Muerto Desert in New Mexico. Scientists, engineers, soldiers, and military officials prepare for an event that very well could end the world. Men lay in the desert sand facing away from a tall tower miles away. A countdown reaches its conclusion. At 5.29 a.m. there's a bright flash of light as the first atomic bomb ever to be detonated releases 8.6 kilotons of energy. The tower the bomb was released from and everything in the surrounding area is instantly vaporized. As a 38,000-foot or 11,582-meter-high mushroom cloud fills the sky, U.S. military officials shake hands and discuss how this new atomic weapon would be used to end the war. J. Robert Oppenheimer stands in the viewing room transfixed on the fireball rising into the air. He's silent, but a Hindu passage passes through his mind. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. 
Sailors aboard the USS Indianapolis watch as soldiers load a series of crates onto their ship. They have not been informed what the cargo is, but the captain has made it clear that once it's secured, the Indianapolis will make its way back to the Pacific Theater with all haste. Several high-ranking generals step off the ship and salute Captain McVeigh. The order is given to shove off. Once the vessel is in open waters, the order to push the engines to full power is given, and the USS Indianapolis darts across the Pacific without an escort. On board are the components that will be used to construct the Little Boy and Fat Man atomic bombs, which will eventually be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th. July 19th, 1945, 11 days before the USS Indianapolis sinks. The tropical islands of Hawaii are spotted in the distance. The engines of the Indianapolis continue to operate at full power. They've set a speed record for traveling from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor in just under 75 hours, but this is not their final destination. The USS Indianapolis docks briefly to resupply, then proceeds to its actual goal of Tinian Island. July 21, 1945, nine days before the USS Indianapolis sinks. Abandoned ship! A sailor calls out aboard the USS Underhill. A Japanese submarine has just launched a series of torpedoes at the destroyer that have blown a hole in its hull. The ship is sinking fast. The incident happens along the Indianapolis's planned route, but this information is never passed along to Captain McVeigh or his crew. The sinking of the Underhill should have served as a warning for what's to come. If the Navy had utilized proper channels and shared intelligence with McVeigh, maybe the disastrous events of the future could have been prevented and hundreds of lives saved. But this is not how things were to play out. Hundreds of men are lost as a result of the USS Underhill sinking. The Indianapolis continues on its pre-planned course. July 26, 1945, four days before the USS Indianapolis sinks. The Indianapolis docks at Tinian Island. The unmarked crates are taken off the ship and driven to a nearby hangar, where the components will be put together. A group of high-ranking military officers watch every move and transfer the containers make. Very few people know what's actually transported to the island. The bombs themselves will not be fully built at Tinian. Instead, they'll be assembled on board the B-29s carrying them to Japan. This will be done to make sure that if one of the planes crashes, the atomic bombs won't detonate prematurely and wipe out the whole island. The USS Indianapolis departs Tinian Island for Guam. From there, it'll continue on its way to the Leyte Gulf in the Philippines. It's here that the Indianapolis is supposed to meet up with a task force to conduct training exercises in preparation for the invasion of Japan. No one knows that the components the ship delivered to Tinian will end the war before the invasion can commence, so military leaders are keeping all options on the table. After docking at Guam and resupplying one last time, the USS Indianapolis departs for the Philippines. The ship and the crew will not make it to their intended destination. July 30, 1945, 12 a.m., 27 minutes before the USS Indianapolis sinks. The vessel cruises through the dark night. The weather is clear, the waters calm. The night watch has taken over. There's no sonar aboard the heavy cruiser, so the Indianapolis has no idea that there is a Japanese sub creeping just below the surface. Without a destroyer escort, the Indianapolis is a sitting duck for a stealthy vessel. But for some reason, that was not taken into consideration by military officials at the time. A skipper spots something on the horizon. It appears to be moving. He brings his binoculars up to his face and squints through the lenses. Whatever it was has disappeared below the waves. Although the skipper swears it was just his eyesight playing up, he still sees something skinny poking up out of the water, as if a periscope is watching them. The skipper orders one of the men to get the captain. McVeigh steps onto the bridge. He's updated on what the skipper has seen. He's about to order the helmsman to begin a zigzag course that is used when submarines are suspected in the area, but before he can give the order, something is spotted in the water. A torpedo is speeding toward the Indianapolis. July 30th, 12.15 a.m. The ship is only halfway to the Philippines when the first torpedo strikes the bow and explodes. The front section of the vessel is blown off. The ship rocks violently. Sailors are thrown out of their bunks. Several die immediately from the explosion. Get us out of here, Captain McVeigh shouts. But before anything can be done, a second torpedo slams into the middle of the ship. The entire vessel lurches to the side. Several hundred feet away, the Japanese sub I-58 drops back below the waves and waits to make sure that its target sinks. The torpedoes have disrupted all power on the Indianapolis. Sailors run through the dark corridors trying to get to their stations, but it's too late. The ship is sinking fast. Seaman First Class Santos Pina rubs his head. Blood gushes from a wound. He stands up and blinks hard to clear his vision. He runs over to one of the sound power phones on the wall but can't reach the bridge for further orders. He drops the phone and runs across the deck, stopping to stare in horror at the missing front of the ship. He pauses for a moment, then proceeds to the railing and jumps over. The Indianapolis will be underwater in minutes. 
Seaman Second Class Don McCall watches as his crewmates jump overboard. They're holding onto their life jackets instead of strapping them on. He notices that as soon as they hit the water, the life jacket explodes up to the surface, but the person holding it is nowhere to be seen as they sink deeper and deeper into the abyss. McCall puts his jacket over his head and secures the straps. He then jumps over the railing and plummets toward the water. When his body enters the ocean, the cold immediately shocks his system. His body feels like it's stretching as his legs continue to descend, and the life jacket pulls his upper body toward the surface. He pops out of the water, gasping for air. A rancid taste fills his mouth. McCall realizes he's covered in oil. He frantically begins swimming away from the wreck before the oil from the ship catches fire. While paddling away, he throws up, getting most of the petroleum he swallowed out of his system. After several minutes of vigorous swimming to get clear, McCall rolls over to look back at the Indianapolis, which has almost completely disappeared below the surface. Ensign Twible looks around at the men near him, struggling to get to their feet. There are no officers around, so he decides to take charge. Grab hold of something, he yells, as he feels the ship lurch forward. The angle of the ship continues to increase relative to the water. Anything not tied down slides past the sailors and into the ocean, including their fellow crewmates. Things are becoming desperate. The sailors are holding onto the railing with their feet dangling under them. Twible shouts for everyone to let go and follow him into the water. He slides down the deck, launching himself over the side at the last moment. Twible dives into the water and begins swimming away from the sinking ship, several men following him. He turns around to look at the chaos. The flames from the torpedo explosions are being doused by seawater as the Indianapolis sinks. There's a hissing sound as the fires hit the water, and the surface of the ocean remains burning where the oil from the ship rests. Twelve minutes after the first torpedo hit, the last reminiscence of the Indianapolis disappears under the black waves of the Pacific. Submarine I-58 records its kill and proceeds to its next objective. 900 of the 1,200 men aboard the Indianapolis bob up and down in the shark-infested waters of the Pacific Ocean. At least 300 men will go down with the ship, and there are no other vessels in the area, so no distress calls have been received by U.S. forces. The crew of the USS Indianapolis are on their own. The remaining men swim toward one another, trying to form groups and get a better handle on the situation. The 900 initial survivors are in disarray. Some have sustained serious injuries. Their blood spills into the water. Dead bodies float past as those who are still alive try to find their friends and comrades. Not everyone has a life jacket, which means some sailors trade off with one another while they search the area for anything that floats. Fear sets in. The crew of the Indianapolis are all alone. No one will come looking for them for at least a couple of days when their ship fails to make it to the Philippines on time. The oil-covered water is filled with teenagers and young men who enlisted to serve their country. Now they've gotten more than they bargained for. Those who have been in the service for several years or have seen combat keep the others calm. However, fear grips every man, as the seemingly bottomless ocean extends for hundreds of miles in every direction. Some just hide their terror better than others. As the sun begins to rise over the horizon, casting an orange glow across the water, a final headcount is taken. It appears only several hundred men made it through the night. Many inevitably drowned from exhaustion or succumbed to their wounds. However, others disappeared under mysterious circumstances, as if there's something in the water that's picking them off one by one. July 31, 1945, two days after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. The Indianapolis fails to arrive at its destination. However, due to a number of mistakes and communication problems, the ship is not reported missing. The men stranded in the middle of the Pacific Ocean are not being looked for. Their time is running out as dehydration begins to set in. There's nowhere to hide from the scorching rays of the sun. The men are being cooked alive. Sunburn speeds up the dehydration process, and dozens of men die every few hours. Signalman Third Class Paul McGinnis leans back in the water struggling to breathe. Floating there is like having your head in a hole in the middle of a mirror with all the sunlight being reflected and burning your face. So hot, it's miserable. Like hell, he thinks. When the sun goes down, the temperatures plummet. At first, it's a relief for many of the men, but after a few minutes, their body temperatures begin to drop. The sailors shiver uncontrollably. Men who were praying for the sun to go down only a little while earlier now plead with God to make the sun rise once again. Their prayers fall on deaf ears. Many pass away from exposure. The survivors try their best to stay in large groups. Even with the support of their crewmates, some still pass away. They're cut from the ropes that keep the group together, and their bodies float away. Twible watches as one of his friends drifts further into the distance. Suddenly, a fin surfaces near the body, then another, and another. A shark's head appears just above the water and bites into the deceased sailor's body, dragging him under. The water begins to bubble as a feeding frenzy commences. The tails of white-tipped sharks break the water as they thrash around and fight with one another for the meal of human flesh. 
but not every creature gets its fill. Some of the sharks break away and start swimming toward the group of men. As they approach, the sailors use debris they collected to keep the predators away. When the sharks disappear below the group, men kick as hard as they can hoping to connect with the shark's gills to deter them from eating them. Even while combating the threat in a large group, the sharks still manage to take a bite out of a sailor every now and then. Blood continuously fills the water, attracting more and more predators to the area. August 1, 1945, three days after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, sharks continue to swim below the sailors who were still alive. Their numbers have been cut by nearly a third. The situation is becoming dire. It seems as if no one will ever come to rescue them. Many men begin to lose all hope. Some of the sailors begin to hallucinate. They scream that they see a ship in the distance and begin swimming away from the group toward the mirage. Others follow. As the men leave the safety of the groups, they're picked off by sharks and torn apart. Anyone who manages to make it out of the safe zone eventually succumbs to exhaustion and dies alone in the middle of the Pacific. Some of the sailors who stay with the groups don't fare much better. They haven't drank any fresh water in days and have become delirious. Sailors begin dipping their heads into the ocean to drink salt water. This only exacerbates the already deteriorating condition. Others begin to go crazy and pull out their knives, fighting with their comrades over nothing. One man who's been drinking salt water comes back up from a dive. The Indy is down below, and they're giving out fresh water and food in the galley, he yells. Follow me, boys! The man dives back down, swimming deeper and deeper. Out of the darkness, a shark appears and sinks his teeth into the hallucinating sailor. August 2, 1945, four days after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Dead bodies float all around. Most have perished from dehydration. One man pries open his crusted eye. He thinks he hears something, but it's likely only in his mind. Then he hears someone else trying to yell. Their voice is hoarse and dry, but the sailor is pointing up into the air. Cutting through the blue sky is an amphibious PBY-5A Catalina patrol plane. Lieutenant Commander Robert Adrian Marks is behind the flight stick. He looks down at the hundreds of small dots in the water. Mother of God, he says. The crew of the Catalina had no idea that the Indianapolis had sunk days prior. In fact, they just happened to stumble across the men in the water by accident. The patrol plane radios for a rescue mission to be launched. They fly low over the water to get a better look. They can see the men straining to wave their arms and signal that they're still alive. Even from the air, it's clear they've been through hell. Marks orders any life rafts and life jackets to be dropped to the crew of the Indianapolis below. Then he calls for a vote. The waters are rough, so landing would be a risk, but he feels that they'll be able to help more by landing. Marks' commanding officer gives him orders over the radio to return to base, but he disregards them after his men aboard the plane vote to put the plane down and help. Marks lowers the seaplane into the water and steers toward the group of men. The crew loads as many men as they can into the plane. There are 12-foot swells that threaten to capsize the aircraft, so they must work fast. After getting 56 survivors on board with several tied to the wings so the aircraft could carry more men, Marks tries to take off, but the plane is too heavy. He waits until the rescue ships arrive. However, while there, the Catalina's crew is able to help as many sailors as possible. The sun sets and the stars come out. The remaining men of the USS Indianapolis know help is finally coming. Unfortunately, many are just too far gone and perish before the rescue ships arrive. Others are eaten by sharks looking for another meal. On the horizon, lights appear. The USS Cecil J. Doyle is the first ship to arrive. It uses its floodlights to locate groups of men in the water and pulls them aboard. The crew of the Doyle places a beacon in the ocean to help the other rescue vessels locate the remaining survivors. Six other ships eventually join the Doyle. The searchlights spot group after group. The men's most prominent feature is their white teeth against their oil-covered skin. When the last of the survivors is hauled into the ship, it's found that only 316 of the 1,200 souls aboard the USS Indianapolis survived the attack and the sinking of their ship. They endured four whole days floating in the shark-infested waters in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The Catalina patrol plane sustained heavy damage from the waves while waiting for the ships to arrive and is unable to take off. The USS Cecil J. Doyle fires its cannons at the aircraft and sinks it to keep the plane from falling into enemy hands. Among the survivors of the Indianapolis is Captain Charles B. McVeigh III. Even though the U.S. military knew about the threat of subs in the area, he was never informed. The USS Indianapolis had also been sent across the Pacific without an escort, capable of detecting submarines. These unforgiving mistakes by military officials are the real reason for the tragedy, but like with so many military mishaps, they look for a scapegoat, and Charles B. McVeigh III is it. August 15, 1945, 16 days after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, Emperor Hirohito announces that Japan will be surrendering to the Allies. His message is carried across the airwaves throughout the nation. The same day, the United States announces the sinking of the USS Indianapolis and the loss of 900 men as a result. 
December 3, 1945, five months after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Mochitsuro Hashimoto is present at the court-martial hearing of Captain Charles B. McVeigh III. He is a key witness as Hashimoto was the commander of I-58, the submarine that sank the USS Indianapolis. When questioned, he informs those in attendance that there was no way for the Indianapolis to avoid the torpedoes fired by following the zigzag procedure. But it doesn't matter. The military needs someone to blame for the Indianapolis disaster and they have already decided that McVeigh will shoulder all the responsibility. At the end of the trial in February of 1946, Charles B. McVeigh III is stripped of his command and found guilty of the failure to follow a zigzag course. He becomes the only captain in the U.S. Navy during World War II to stand trial for the loss of a ship in combat. The court recommends clemency, and instead of being court-martialed, McVeigh is given a decrease in seniority. This is all just for show, though, as it's never mentioned that the U.S. military knew there were Japanese submarines operating in the area and failed to pass this information along to McVeigh. He retires in 1949 at the rank of Rear Admiral. Charles B. McVeigh dies on November 6, 1968. 1998 53 years after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Hunter Scott, a 12-year-old from Pensacola, Florida, conducts a series of interviews with several crewmen of the USS Indianapolis for his National History Day project. His hard work and attention to detail causes Congressman Joe Scarborough to take notice. A movement is initiated culminating in Hunter Scott and the survivors of the USS Indianapolis appearing in Congress to argue for the exoneration of Charles B. McVeigh III. The following year, Congress passes a resolution which is signed by President Bill Clinton, posthumously exonerating McVeigh. In 2001, a memorandum is attached to McVeigh's naval records that formally absolve him of all blame for the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. July 2016, 71 years after the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, new information is uncovered that provides a more precise location for the wreck of the USS Indianapolis. It's determined that the heavy cruiser was sunk further west than originally thought. On August 19, 2017, a team of researchers led by the co-founder of Microsoft, Paul Allen, locate the remains of the Indianapolis. They rest at a depth of 18,000 feet, or 5,486 meters in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, where they will remain forever as a memorial to the men who lost their lives serving aboard the USS Indianapolis during World War II. Now watch the truth about why America dropped atomic bombs on Japan, or check out the real story of World War II prisoners trapped inside a cannibal camp.